Ok cho Ông Chúng ta có cảm tố Các chúng ta có thể Thì sẵn là các Đó là các chúng ta Sẽ bị nhà Ông ta giết Ông ta Một tố Các tăng sớm luôn Nên đào chụp vụ Nên chụp nền That's why I'm interested because you talked about interviews you in the 1980s, I believe. Did you discuss this topic with him at all, the democratic attack to Vietnam during the PKG? No, I don't recall discussing that. Uh, just one uh, question which stood out to me was that uh, I asked him who were the most influential people in his politically influential people in world history. And the uh, first person he mentioned was Mao Zedong. Um, I, I will also add that he added as a salt to the American television network, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, no, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't him, um, any comment on this particular you said that was an ABC? CBS. CBS. Uh, interview, ABC you know, was it broadcast? CBS, CBS. No, it was never broadcast. You also mentioned that you spoke to the King Father. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that conversation? That was in uh, Ben Sen, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Thailand, in 1985. Um, and uh, I mainly engaged uh, the King Father, the late King Father, and discussions of historical questions rather than contemporary events about his relationships towards various political figures in the world um, and uh, towards the United States. Uh, and, um, that lasted for about 90 minutes. Did you recall if you discussed with him his relationship with the group that he married? No, I, I don't recall discussing that with him. Uh, uh, you know, I may, I may have uh, discussed, but nothing that was said was, was exceptional. What stays in my mind are the things that were exceptional in the conversation. So he may have said things, but uh, uh, he, he thanked me at the end of the meeting for not discussing contemporary political events and only discussing the historical events, which he said, so you did not discuss, I gather, in that last answer, um, why he was at that moment working with the remnants of the DK regime to fight against the Vietnamese occupation of the country. No, I don't recall that part of it. But again, you know, if, if we did discuss it, the reason I won't recall it is because it would have been an obvious, the comments would have been obvious to me, nothing new. What stands in my mind was what he told me that was new to me, new information, which are, there were some significant examples of. But with regard to, uh, I knew that, uh, he had a tactical alliance with the, uh, the Khmer Rouge to repel the Vietnamese invasion of the country. You have described him. ลูกบานลูกบริญญาคือเกาะใบกระดาษบ่าย <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I will.
You described the King Father as a practical and realistic man. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? What I mean by that is that uh, he uh, had a set of political goals and tried to achieve the best possible uh, in the most practical way. That is, uh, he wanted to keep Cambodia independent <coughs> that and uh, therefore he pursued policies which he thought would achieve that. I, I brought this up in contrast because I wanted to contrast the policies of DK, which I felt were not practical. Do you to make that clear? What is the difference? Uh, basically, the... Um, the prince, well, he was then the prince, the late king father was then a, a titled prince, you know. uh, uh, he, uh, as I, I think I mentioned in some of the uh, earlier uh, comments that I made, uh, to uh, the he, um, represented, uh, he understood that there was a hostility from Vietnam towards the Cambodians, or at least a condescending, patronizing attitude. Um, that uh, Vietnam had imperial orientations, he understood he had to do everything he could to prevent those uh, ambitions from being realized. Uh, and that included not provoking the uh, and I draw that contrast with the contrast uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the real attitudes of um, the DK were towards non-Khmer ethnic groups. Um, because the DK was really a, a tradition totalitarian revolutionary movements like the Soviet Communist Party, like the Chinese Communist Party. And their, their ambition was to eradicate cultural differences in society. So, uh, it wasn't because they necessarily specifically hated Vietnamese or Vietnam. Uh, other ethnic groups, ethnic differentiation was an Somebody once told me that uh, they often frequently in, in the period in recent years before his arrest, uh, Yang Suri was often seen eating at a Vietnamese restaurant in uh, uh, I suspect that he wasn't particularly hostile to Vietnamese, uh, but they were an obstacle to uh, ambitions. I'm going to switch topics a bit rather than go into more depth on that. And I'd like to read to you from some other authors who talk about Vietnamese views of Khmer Rouge leaders, DK And um, perhaps I'll start with Dmitry Musyakov. This is at 83-964-44. Uh, 
ERN is 0101 in French 01124 Mr. Masikov was a Russian scholar at the Institute of Oriental Studies in Moscow when I met him. Um, he's an expert in Cambodian affairs and uh, I hired him as an assistant in my research. Uh, in order to be like I said earlier was a kind of screener of documents for me to provide me with uh, make a decision about what documents are the most relevant to my research um, uh, I gave him a lot of leeway in terms of time and uh, he spent some of his time doing his own research in the archives while I was there pertaining to Cambodia. In, 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 in the, in, on this page, he indicates that Paul Pot introduced Nguyen a person trusted in Hanoi, who laid dormant leader of the Vietnamese Vietnam communists, in a conversation with the Soviet ambassador, called a politician of, quote, pro-Vietnam orientation, as the occupant of the second Vietnamese post in the party. Speaking of Nguyen Chia, they do merely emphasize, quote, he is our man indeed, and my personal friend, and the footnote indicates that this was a record of the Soviet ambassador with the link dated November 16, 1976. He goes on to say uh, several pages later in Khmer, 011200 he said in October 1978, according to a high-ranking Vietnamese party spokesman for Cambodia, Hanoi still believes that there were two prominent party figures in Phnom Penh who with Vietnam. Nguyen Chea, in the former first secretary of the Eastern Zone, South Pimp. Friends were aware, a Soviet diplomat reported that Chea opposes Pol Pot's regime. He deeply sympathizes with the CPD, but fearing reprisals, he cannot speak his mind. And then the last from Masakov on the next page, same year in, in uh, French, one more in Khmer and one more in English. He said, give me his hopes that these figures would lead in an uprising against Pol Pot turned out to be groundless. South Pem perished the revolt in June 78, while Nguyen Chea, as it is known, turned out to be one of the most devoted followers it is difficult to understand why, until the end of 1978, it was believed in Hanoi that Nguyen Chea was their man. In spite of the fact that all previous experience should have proved quite the contrary. Was Hanoi unaware of his permanent siding with Pol Pot? His demands that, quote, the Vietnamese minority should not be allowed to reside in Cambodia, unquote, is extreme cruelty, as well as the fact that in comparison with Nguyen Chea, People considered Pol Pot a paragon of kindness. Now, but what I'm interested in, uh, Professor, is your view of what we can take 
from these Soviet archives. And the Vietnamese, apparently, at the time, that Nun Chea was sympathetic to their position and in opposition to Pol Pot. Vietnam which I can think I can say for all parties present in the courtroom, and me if I'm wrong, none of the Vietnamese had that completely wrong. So what does that say to you about whether the Vietnamese had, in fact, good intelligence, had, in fact, penetrated the leadership of the CPK to know what was really going on within the CPK. I think it tells us that the Vietnamese have very poor intelligence about what was going on in the leadership of the CPK. Uh, and uh, may have had poor intelligence even more broadly about what was going on in the countryside. Now, the accused persons, accused of Bonanunchea, have said that there were traitors and Vietnamese agents, even within the Central Committee and the Standing Committee. What does this tell you about whether this makes sense, given that Vietnam thought that Nunchea was the closest friend? Well, I think it certainly raises questions about the reality of that belief that there were enemies at such a high level of the Communist Party of Cambodia. I certainly, again, I would like to go back to a point that I made earlier. Um, this belief of enemies penetrating the party at the highest level the future of the Soviet Communist Party, the future of the Chinese Communist Party, the Korean Communist Party, uh, and the internal purges and terror campaigns, the Supreme Leader uh, would always use such justifications, and he may have actually believed them, but use such justifications for a campaign of terror within the Would you agree that that, of course, over time and with leaderships? So, with Stalin, it may have been different than with subsequent leaders. With uh, the Lin Biao, I believe it was, a campaign in China, different from other periods under Deng Xiaoping, for example. Yes, it, uh, it's a product of a paranoid mindset, which is a characteristic of revolutionary elites. Um, it certainly wasn't a characteristic of the mindset of Deng Xiaoping. Thank you. Now, um, you had mentioned that Nun Chia had been in Vietnam, and there's a couple of quotes from the book Behind the Killing Fields. I'd like to read to you and then get your comment. This is E3 slash 4202. In English, it's 0075751. In Khmer, 00858293. In French, 0084940. Indicates that Nunchea was the main Khmer Rouge liaison with the Vietnamese during Cambodia's civil war. Since he had traveled to Vietnam in 1953 for training, he knew the personalities of his Vietnamese counterparts, which made him the ideal negotiator. I am the compromiser, and I was close to Nguyen Van Ninh, and we could talk easily And then the second quote. Is that ERN in Khmer 00858279? In French, 00849. Excuse me, 849394. And in English, 00757506. This is 
in the book they quote Nunchea as saying I like reading books about how to work in secret and Vietnamese books they talked about the torture and the rest of communist members so what do you can you tell us about what Nguyen Chea was doing in Vietnam and his relationship with the Vietnamese. I can't tell you a lot about it. Uh, I can tell you very little. But, uh, he would have been one of the leading figures trained by the um, Vietnamese in the early 1950s and uh, therefore would have had a certain relationship uh, with them, a favourable relationship with them from the point of view because the Vietnamese always believed that the people they trained would remain loyal to them. This, was, this is turned out to be false, uh, as in the case of, for example, Pennsylvania, the, uh, one obvious example. Um, but uh, I think that um, uh, Nguyen Chia, because of his pedigree uh, in the Indo-Chinese Communist Movement, uh, would have been favorably treated by the Vietnamese, and that's the reason for uh, the misinterpretation of his attitudes towards Vietnam. What can you tell us about the relationship between this movement that Sino called the Khmer Rouge, Communist Party, they weren't called that then. But starting, as you know, in 1968, they began an armed Rebellion against the government of Sien. I believe that government also had been elected against the monarchy. What was the relationship at that time between 1968 and the coup in 1970 between the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese? The, uh, the, the, the uh, Khmer Rouge and Vietnamese had different objectives between 1968 and the Khmer Rouge, as you've stated correctly, wanted to overthrow the government of then Prince Sihanouk, whilst the Vietnamese wanted to keep him in power because he was allowing them to use Cambodia as a staging area and as a supply base through Sihanouk for their war in South Vietnam. But as the Vietnamese very favorably disposed towards retention of Vietnam, the Sihanouk government. Um, and so there was a conflict of interest between the Khmer Rouge who were based in the northeast of Cambodia in the mountainous provinces of the northeast and the Vietnamese who were uh, um, in the eastern parts of Cambodia, a little bit further, some of which were a bit further south. For the years between, let's say, 1968 and 1972, that two years before the coup and two years after, did the Khmer Rouge seek the assistance of the Vietnamese and did they receive any? Well, I think that the Khmer Rouge did receive the Vietnamese at that time, especially from 1970 to 1972, after the coup d'etat of March 1970 by Lon Nô um, uh, the Vietnamese communists who had been told by Lon Nô to get out of Cambodia launched a series of offensives in late March of 1970 against the Lon, the Lon Nol government and, and then subsequently expanded the war into Cambodia in more generally 
Đời thực hiện bản bệnh trẻ bình môn chân kỳ thơm Việt Nam phía chất án nơi kháng bộ biệt Cái đại bê đầm mình cả chiến biên Bê nông cư Việt Nam tầm ảnh hướng bản Thì bản chất lát màu kêu đầy càng bệnh trí hai bà đẹp trăm Ở miền trí ăn cập hiếp miền trẻ đã chất lát xung quanh thơm 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 Đại quốc kế phía diêm Châu xã hạ ca cho mùi phân nẹ nghe Khám ai đã bận động đạo đại Việt Nam Đã dưỡng hạ thật khám ai Việt Minh Phần tài nó bê nó bê nó bê nó bê nó bê nó bê Khám ai cả hôm đưa tây tiết nó Bạn đăng ẩm bê dưới tờ xa hình nế Kê dưới tờ xa hình bộ Việt Nam Hai bạn đo khám ai Việt Minh Chánh bê ra chân á xâm phong Công bình ích cầm bê chìa Để chân này ở vây đã ca chân đó chân nằm chất sắp lực chất sắp bê Khi thà công bình ích Việt Nam Bạn chú ý đã khám ai cả hôm đầm bê bằng Khát mô lật thà nó bọc bộ kế phần tay Bố kế có bàn chui phong đàn nơi mùa lật hàn dù thìa bà chàng nâng lùn đòi phong đàn. Phải là nhà, kỳ đoạt bà hà. Rồi hốt đã đập bông bông mê xa chật bàm bình ta, con công lăng khám ai gà hôm tự tu bàn áo vật của rộp đồng xe ưu phì nở nà. Nẹ chùm đề kê tự tu bàn áo vật của rộp đồng xe ưu phì chân. Some of it would have come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and been provided technically by the Vietnamese, but it was Chinese arms. Thank you. Now I want to switch topics a bit and talk about the DK claims about Within their ranks, Michael Vickery is an academic. Do you know him? I do know of him. Yes. Frequently cited by the defense in this case. He wrote in 1857, and the ERN is only the this portion is only in English. He said that the DK leadership in Sari and Salazar, in particular, never were pro-Vietnamese, and they became increasingly anti-Vietnamese as time went on. While those who were in any degree at all pro-Vietnamese were mercilessly eliminated between 1975 and 1979. You wrote in your book, it's English ERN 0100173. There is no evidence that the people whom Pol Pot's emissaries attempted to kill were agents of Vietnam. On the contrary, the people Pol Pot was now attempting to kill had loyally carried out orders of the Khmer Rouge leadership for the previous three years. These orders had involved them attacking Vietnamese and ethnic Cambodian civilian targets inside Vietnam. And bearing the Just to provide all the quotes and get one question. Elizabeth Becker, Elizabeth Becker, English And French the next page. She wrote that 
about the same year, 1976, she's talking about 1976, in the midst of this chaos, the Eastern Zone Army was ordered to the border to push back encroaching Vietnamese troops. After several skirmishes, the center rebuked Sao Pim, the Eastern Zone leader, for fighting the Vietnamese too zealously and warned him not to upset the tenuous balance on the border. She goes on to say uh, on another page, and that is English 00 French she said, referring to Sao Pim, it was too much a part of the system to imagine it turning against him or to recognize the clues when the center did turn on him. He was a party elder. He had been a member of the elite standing committee since the 1950s. He had been party secretary of the Eastern Zone since 1960. He had personally built up the Eastern Zone Army. And on the next page he says, Yet when Pol Pot ordered the execution of the Khmer communists who returned from Hanoi with the Vietnamese troops, Pim obeyed. Eastern Zone deputies like Phun Chun oversaw the detention and execution of the returnees within the regime region in 1974, but nowhere in this record is there a hint of Sao Pim being a close friend of Vietnam. Rather, he was proud of his record of refusing to become dependent on Vietnam in war or peace, nor was there a hint of rebellion. So I'd like you to comment on what these other writers have written, and, and also you, I didn't read all of the uh, excerpts in your book. Was there a rational belief by the DK leaders that their ranks were riven with traitors and agents of Vietnam? In the, in the period of the war uh, against the Lon Nol government, I think it was true that there were agents of Vietnam within the Kampuchean Communist Party, and that Pol Pot was correct in thinking so. Uh, not all the Khmer Viet Minh, as I, I want to reiterate, not all of the people trained in Hanoi were loyal to Hanoi, turned out to be loyal to Hanoi, but there were a substantial number who were and who could have been considered to be compliant with uh, Hanoi's interests in Indochina. However, most of these people had been killed by 1975, and therefore the purges and terror campaign, campaigns which took place after 1975, were aimed at people who were loyal members of the system. I, I believe that it was a paranoid fantasy on the part of Pol Pot to think that people within the party who had been loyal to the party throughout a long period of time were in fact agents of Vietnam. Instead, I, 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 I think it was not not only paranoia, but uh, also an attempt to explain weakness uh, in conflict with Vietnam. In other words, the people like in the Eastern Zone who took the brunt of the fighting of Vietnam and who were not successful in their fighting with Vietnam must have been traitorous in order not to defeat Vietnam. Again, this is a part of a paranoid political culture which permeates Are there other examples of such regimes where they blame their own failures on sabotage, traitors within their ranks?
Certainly, Stalin's regime did that, and so did Mao's regime. I'd like to uh, read to you something that is written by Chanda, where he's quoting Stephen Hedder. This is E3 slash 2376. In English, it's 00192380. In Khmer, 00191527. And in French, 00237063248. He said, in light of what happened since the massacres in Tainin, it has also become clear that it was no isolated act of madness. The attack on the eve of Pol Pot's first official trip to China was clearly aimed at impressing on China the seriousness of Cambodia's determination to fight Vietnam. American scholar Stephen Hedder believes that the September 24th attack on Tainin, launched by divisions 3 and 4 of Cambodia's eastern zone, was a double gift at a time when a countrywide hunt for suspected Vietnamese sympathizers was on. The Eastern Zone leader's zeal in killing Vietnamese was proof of loyalty to Pol Pot as well as an offering for him to carry to Beijing. Do you think uh, that there is some um, logic in Hedder's belief that the Eastern Zone's participation in these Killing of Vietnamese was partially aimed to prove their loyalty to Pol Pot. Yes, I agree. Let me talk a little, ask you a little bit about the relationship between Democratic Cambodia and the Soviet Union, and then between, uh, then we'll go into. China and the Soviet Union. Do you know what happened on the 17th of April when the Khmer Rouge took Phnom Penh to the Soviet Embassy? Yes, I believe that the Khmer Rouge fired a missile into the Soviet Embassy. Can you explain why the what the relations were and why the state of relations was as they were. Uh, the relations were poor uh, because the Soviet Union had not broken relationship with the Lon Nol government. That's the first reason. Uh, and I think the second reason is that the Khmer Rouge, being Maoist in their orientation, were regarded the Soviet Union as a revisionist power. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad word in Marx, amongst Marxist Leninist purists, to call somebody a revisionist and you're abandoning some of the fundamental principles of Marxism. And I believe that, uh, that's how they regarded the Soviet Union. So there was a double uh, uh, set of factors, two, two, set, two factors which would uh, compel the, uh, them to be hostile towards the Soviet Union. And what about the relationship in this time period between China and the Soviet Union? Can you talk about that? Then the, the period I'm talking about is um, the DK period, 1975 to 79. But you can explain earlier events that affected that relationship. Yes, um, relationships between the Soviet Union and China were extremely bad. Uh, they had hit rock bottom in 1969 when the Soviets actually threatened to take uh, action, launch an attack against uh, Chinese military installations. 
did not do, in part because of a warning from the United States not to do it. But the relationships continued to sour throughout the 1970s, and the Chinese regarded the Soviet Union as an expansion of power, which was intending to surround China strategically, and that Vietnam was one of the um, instruments of uh, Soviet uh, policy, uh, Cuba being the other one. Uh, uh, from 1975 to 1978, I think that um, uh, Soviet-Chinese relationship continued to get worse. Uh, and, uh, I think that um, Khmer Rouge was still sym sympathetic to China in a, in a total and overall sense until 1976 when Mao died. I think that their fervor for China as a nation diminished after the death of Mao. And the uh, most loyal uh, friend, the only country which uh, the Khmer Rouge considered to be a good friend uh, after 1976 was North Korea. You put the change in the DK view towards China at the death of Mao or the um, subsequent fall of the Gang of Four to Deng Xiaoping's eventual emergence. I think that was about a year later, was it? Yes, I think, uh, well, I, I, I'd restate it then. Um, the, the Khmer Rouge became somewhat disillusioned with China as a result of the death of Maoism, which involved the Gang of Four. And did, in fact, China and the Soviet Union actually have armed clashes over a dispute about where their border was? Yes, they did. So for China, uh, how did they view the Vietnam's relationship with the Soviet Union? China's, uh, China viewed uh, Vietnam's relationship with the Soviet Union as a sign of ingratitude towards Chinese assistance over the whole history of uh, the Vietnamese Communist Movement, Chinese uh, support for Vietnam over the entire history of the Vietnamese Communist Movement. Uh, uh, that, that was the first thing. And the second thing was uh, that they regarded uh, the Soviet Union as using Vietnam against China. Did Vietnam and China have territory Yes, they did. Uh, even during the period of before the fall of South Vietnam, there were disputes over the Paracel and Spratly Islands, disputes which continue to this day. And can you briefly uh, put on the record the view of the difference in the power, the military power of the Soviet Union and China at that time in the late 1970s? Uh, although China had nuclear weapons, uh, the Soviet Union was a vastly superior military power, a global superpower. Uh, China was a regional power. In your view, would uh, Chinese uh, fear of encirclement by the Soviet Union, Soviet bases in Vietnam, be uh, irrational? Yes, it was a, ra a rational 
เนี่ยจําเลยคือถ้าประธานมันบูรณะในนามอภัยคลาดแบบนี้ China regarded Cambodia as a possible buffer against Vietnamese expansion. And uh, it should be noted that China has always had a special relationship with Cambodia, uh, going back to um, the late King Father's rule when he was uh, both king and then uh, Prince Sihanouk. I want to ask you about something you wrote on page 72 of your book. The URL is 01001739. You wrote, Note, Pol Pot's political judgment that building socialism quickly, which had already involved massacring hundreds of thousands of people, destroying their traditional culture and institutions, and creating second-class citizens out of the new people, would make Cambodia internally stronger and better able with its, to deal with its external enemies. This judgment suggests a total disconnection from reality, which is clearly the product of paranoia and misguided ideological assumptions. He wrote on page 237, the URN is 01001910. Paul Pot's power within his party was never seriously challenged after 1972. And by 1977, his preemptive purges of the party and military had eliminated any possibility of a coup. Paul Pot's purges against non-existent enemies during 1978 further weakened his already weak political and military position in relation to his foreign enemies. Can you talk about that? Do the DK policies, particularly these internal purges, purges of the East Zone Army and other setting up detention centers around the country, other Khmer, uh, DK policies, did they, in your view, help to assure the independence of Cambodia? Or did they make it more likely that Cambodia would lose its independence and actually weaken the country towards any potential foreign invaders? Uh, I believe the latter interpretation is correct. It severely weakened Cambodia's ability to engage in conflict with any neighbor, um, with the possible exception of Laos, with, with which uh, Cambodia was not in conflict. Um, I, would, I would like to point out, again, to use historical analogies, that this is a replication of kinds of behavior we see from revolutionary totalitarian dictators in the past, Stalin's, in the, in the, in the, in the wake of a, the rise of Nazi Germany, Stalin purged not only his party leadership, but also his military, and severely weakened the capability of the Soviet Union to face Nazi Germany. Similarly, there were pur in China, there were purges of the Chinese military at a time when China regarded the Soviet Union as a mortal threat to China. Mao Zedong carried out these terrorist purges against the armed 
forces leadership uh, in a way which diminished his capability to deal with any possible future confrontation with the Soviet Union. So Pol Pot was in a way behaving just like the two giants of international communism. Uh, in carrying out an internal purge against people whom he needed and, in, and in, in fact in the general policy that he was pursuing, uh, weakening the country's ability to resist Vietnam if that's what he really thought was the main threat to Cambodia. Well, in your view, were his policies aimed at strengthening the country against Vietnam? or maintaining a small clique, his clique of leaders in power. I, I believe the latter. Um, although he wanted to resist what he saw as a Vietnamese threat, um, he, he, what he was doing at the same time undermined his capabilities. He mentioned, I believe, this morning, his, or perhaps it was yesterday afternoon, some historical attitudes of Khmer people towards Vietnam, a country that has uh, much larger than that over the centuries has taken territory from what was previously part of the Khmer Empire. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, for, further about that. In particular, how did in the, during the Vietnam War, at the time of the 1970 coup, or before and after that, how were the Vietnamese welcomed or not welcomed by the Khmer people inside of Cambodia, Vietnamese that were using bases in Cambodia? Around, yes, in the year 1970. Before and after 1970. Uh, the Vietnamese presence in Cambodia was not popular. It was not popular during the time of Sihanouk, which is one of the reasons why Sihanouk went overseas in early 1970 to try and convince the Soviets and the Chinese to get the Vietnamese out of Cambodia, the Vietnamese troops which were occupying the eastern zone of Cambodia. That was his mission when he was overthrown. Um, uh, most Cambodian people uh, are hostile towards the Vietnamese and uh, would not have uh, embraced any Vietnamese military presence in the country. And would you say they would not have embraced then uh, a Vietnamese invasion and capture of their capital before the Yes, I think that's correct. And do you think that the Khmer Rouge DK policies affected how the, uh, what resistance there was to the eventual Vietnamese invasion? How it changed people's lives? Yes, I, I, I think it uh, affected the, the way they reacted. I think that um, the Cambodian people didn't want either a Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia nor a Khmer Rouge control of Cambodia, which is why uh, in the elections which were held in 1993, a majority of Cambodians voted for the non-communist forces of the late Father King and of uh, the Republican Party of uh, the late Mr. Son San. The majority of people reject communism and they reject uh, Vietnamese control of the country. However, in this 70 to 75 war, there was, we can talk about it, a certain amount of popular support or support for the front the opposition to Lan Nol, headed 
theoretically, by Sihanouk. To what extent did Sihanouk's presence in that government affect the popular the ability of the Khmer Rouge to gain popular support? I think that uh, Sihanouk's role, then Prince Sihanouk's role, was vital in helping the Khmer Rouge gain popular support. Um, it should be noted, however, that there were royalist forces fighting against Lon Nol. There was a royalist army, um, though dwarfed by the, t the rival communist factions. Uh, but I think that um, uh, it was his political legitimacy uh, which helped uh, the Khmer Rouge softened some of the opposition to the Khmer Rouge, uh, which would otherwise have uh, existed. Uh, there is a, something on that point um, that I wanted to bring up, but I can't find it now, but perhaps you recollect it, maybe it was from your book. Do you recall in your con uh, any conversation with Sihanouk or reading about Sihanouk talking about badges with his picture being produced? Yes, it was in my book. Uh, uh, there were badges produced uh, at the behest uh, of the, I can't remember whether it was the Chinese or the North Vietnamese, badges of Sihanouk which were to be used uh, and uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, win popular support. Uh, during the war. This was at a time in which the Vietnamese were still present in Cambodia during the 1970-75 war. And uh, it was the Pol Pot group uh, which took the badges and threw them away because they didn't want too much credit for the success to be I think I have time for just one last question today. So I would like you to comment on uh, something you wrote in your book. This is at ERN 01001774. You quote the Vietnamese leader, Le Duan, as having called the existing system in Cambodia at that time. A DK, quote, slave holding communism, unquote. Can you tell us uh, what he meant by that? Well, that uh, I think what he understood was that uh, the system of uh, party control of society was so onerous uh, with people not paid for their work except in food uh, and, uh, and, and an insufficient amount of food that uh, it was a form of slavery uh, rather than uh, the kind of uh, communism that existed in uh, Vietnam. Um, some of these issues are matters of degree, of course, but... Um, the, the situation in Cambodia was very extreme, of course, in 1975 to 1978. <coughs> ហើយសម្រាប់ការនៅថ្ងៃស្អែកនេះអង្គជំនាញនឹងធ្វើតាមណាការបន្តដល់ប្រទេសកម្ពុជាអ្នកជំនាញស្ទេហ៊ុនរ
ให้ประกอบอวุธไตรตบาลาการรถมวยจมูกนึงบอกลึกในองค์เพียบของเพียสะใส่หนึ่งเนี่ยจมดิ้งน้องกายจุนเนี่ยจมดิ้งมูริเวลตลอดการกระไรกดในวิ้งนึงเอาจีกดบอกตลอดมวยโจรวมสามาการในไทยไอให้ประกอบอวุธแรมตีคงแข็งนอมจนจับจอดตั้งปีรูปลงนุนเทียนตั้งลุกเคืองตั้งพร้อมตลอดการมันตีคงแข็งในอวุธตะกอเป็นจ๊อกในประกอบอวุธครูนอมครูกดตลอดโจรวมสามาการในไทยไอมันมุนมองกับบุญปรึกสมรัยจ๊อกส่งชิงกับเชอ